Thank you everyone for joining us in the second discussion in this series, which is on healing. We're exploring the ideas of art and expression on healing from trauma, whether that trauma is experienced on an individual or a collective or a community level. This series is curated by Lara Arafe and by myself, and will be running until mid-December, so please stay tuned for our talks in the next weeks. We're so excited to have Mona with us today. Mona Haidar is a rapper, poet, activist, amongst many other things. Mona grew up in Flint, Michigan, and is from a Syrian American background. Mona developed her sound, which is deeply rooted in her intersectional identity. Mona's debut song, Rap My Hijab, which is amazing, was named one of 2017's top protest songs and was later named one of the top 25 feminist anthems of all time. So thank you, Mona, for joining us. The talk will be moderated by Ahmed Aoude. Ahmed is originally from Cairo. He's a data scientist, an entrepreneur, and an Arab culture enthusiast. Thank you, Ahmed, as well. Over to you. All right. It's such an honor to be moderating this talk with Mona today. Thank you, Mona, for joining us today. I'm so excited to be having this. Thanks, guys. Farah, Lara, uh, and Ahmed for all your hard work, first of all, in putting this together. So uh, I, I know we just went over the bio, but do you want to give us sort of an overview of how you got to where you were, how you became interested in poetry and music and what it means to you? Yeah, so... I mentioned, you mentioned that I grew up in Flint, but I was actually born in Saudi, And it was one of those back and forth situations where my parents immigrated from Damascus when they were newlyweds and said, we're only gonna stay five years. And then of course, you know, five years turns into 15, turns into six kids, turns into our kids don't speak Arabic, so we're gonna take them to Saudi, so make sure they get the language, right? Plus, of course, there's job opportunities. So my family actually, you know, we didn't grow up with music. We didn't really grow up with poetry at that time. You know, a lot of that stuff was considered like too cultural, you know, not Islamic enough. And so I, um, you know, didn't grow up with a lot of that. Like we grow up with with kind of the the more traditional like shabby songs like Mama, Mama, Mama. <laughs> <laughs> but beyond that there wasn't much culture actually and so it made me really hungry for that kind of stuff and I remember going to the Arabi store and seeing these CDs by Um Kultum and I was like you know like let's get this you know it's sold the Arabi store it can't be that bad you know because music of course was considered haram and my mom looked at the album that I grabbed and it happened to be El Albi Asha Kulli Gamil for Um Kulthum. And she was like, okay, this is a good one. It's okay. Um, so we took it home and I just remember kind of falling in love. And of course I had already been sneaking radio in the basement, recording little cassettes from the radio and stuff like that. And then at about like 14 years old, 13, 14, I started hitching rides with my older friends to downtown Flint where they, they were doing poetry slams and stuff. And it was the kind of thing of like the first time I heard somebody like perform poetry in that way, like at a slam as competition, I just totally fell in love. And it was something that captivated me. And I had these notebooks full of poetry. I had already been writing. You know, I have poems back in my kindergarten journal where I'm first learning to write. And at 14 years old, my friends are like, well, you should try, you know, you should go up there next time. And I'm just like, I could never do that. You know, like I, Shuma, it's like, it's against all the rules, you know, for a girl to do that. But my friends were insistent. My, one friend in particular, my best friend, who, who is the one who first pulled me to these events. And she and I just kept going. And I tried one time. I totally failed. Nothing came out of my mouth. And that was the beginning of my poetry career, a miserable failure. <laughs> That's awesome. It's kind of an inspirational story and, and it's so relatable to even the part about my kids don't speak out of it, so let's take them to Saudi. So the thing that you mentioned is that your family was very heavy on religion growing up and they tried to sort of stray away from the culture and that sort of magnetized you to it. And obviously, religion has played a really big part in, in you becoming who you are. You did a master's in Christian ethics. And how, how do you sort of reconcile the fact that the culture was sort of alienated in favor of religion 
And how did you come to a point where you're, you're tying it back into your life in a way that fits you, especially when you had such a strong pushback early on in your life? Okay, it's so cliche, I know, but I'm going to say it. You know, we were never American enough, enough in America, and we were never Arab enough in the Middle East. You know, no matter what we did, we were always the, the outsiders, you know. And I feel like we all, all the children of immigrants, we have the same story of when you go back to the homeland, you're just not enough of that thing for anyone around you, not your cousins, not your grandparents. You're like shameful. You don't know anything. You don't pronounce things right. You know, it's just like, it's, it's difficult to find your place and to figure out who you are in the middle of a global diaspora. You know, my family ended up having to leave Saudi because of the Gulf War. And like fleeing something like war is interesting because it gives you, I don't know, I don't know. Somebody recently asked me if I, I, I remember that time. I was only two years old, but if I remember that. And I know that we carry those kinds of things in our bodies. So... I, I think being somebody who is so magnetized to religion and to culture and has studied the religion, I feel like I don't anymore feel like there's a conflict between the two. And growing up when I was young, I was made to believe that there is some kind of conflict between the two. You know, that like, this thing is only cultural, it's not Islamic, so we just leave it aside. When actually the Prophet Muhammad was really interested in culture and cultural norms, you know, and that those things were considered to be beautiful. And Islam came as a way to, to beautify those things and to remove the wrong from them, not to obliterate them or to annihilate them. But somehow we got it in our minds. And I think this has something to do with our colonial identities. In this, in this modern era that tells us that we can only be Muslim or we can only be Arab or we can only be, you know, secular in order to be liberated. We, can only, we can't like embrace our tradition and our culture and the place that we live in. Otherwise, it's too many things to, to handle. But we're complicated and we're complex. And I, I have learned, especially now in my 30s, that the more complex I am, the happier I am. And the more I try to fixate on one part of my identity, the, the less content and happy and solid I feel in my core. I, I'm very much happy to be a religious person who is inspired by religion and a cultural person who's inspired by my indigenous culture and somebody who loves the place that I grew up, Flint, Michigan, you know, and is proud to be Flint, from Flint, Michigan, and is also uh, in, the, in, my, in the zeitgeist of my own small circle, also considering the colonial story here within America, you know, so like I can, I can hold all of those things, all those seemingly disparate ideas and not have to choose. And I think we, we were presented with a choice and I think that's the mistake. That's the false consciousness that we have to let go of. I love that. So it's like you managed through your work to move past this duality between religion and culture and understand that it's not a duality. You know, they can operate side by side. They have to, in fact. You know, otherwise you kind of lose yourself. And if you're not able to embrace all of the parts of yourself, that's, that's when we start to, to lose it a little bit. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. So another thing that you talk about is spirituality is healing. And obviously the way that you approach your poetry and your music, it, it seems very anti-colonial. And the Rock My Hijab song became one of the top 25 protest songs of all time. As a member of the diaspora, how have you incorporated spirituality into your work to accelerate your healing, to help you reconcile the traumas that you've gone through as, as a Syrian American, as an Arab American, as a Muslim American, and so on? I love that question. I think, I, I really do believe that within every single one of us, we have the capacity to liberate our own selves. And what that means is that we're born with intrinsic knowledge on not just who we are, but also who we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to do in this world. 
And I think when we stand up and we do that work that we're supposed to be doing, whether it's being a lawyer or a creative or a doctor or a poet or a janitor, whatever that work that we were called here to do in this world, when we do it, our soul is happy, you know, that we are dichotomous beings of binary, you know, that we have something that is ineffable inside of us, this spirit. And then we also have these physical bodies, you know, that have desires and pain and emotion. But when we over identify with just our bodies, we lose the spirit. And when we just identify with our spirit, we lose our bodies, we lose our sense of, you know, um, groundedness on this, in this, in this uh, life. And for me, I can't tell you how hard it was to learn this lesson. You know, being told growing up that poetry and music were just a hobby, that you can't do that. It's not a job. It's not real. And it was painful because being told that, that my passion and my purpose were just hobbies that they're not real and nobody's going to take you seriously. And it's not something you should take seriously. It's just a, a fleeting thing that you're going to grow out of. When I knew deep down that it was my purpose, that it was my calling and, and letting go of my purpose so many times and that causing intense pain, not just, not just like, um, psychological pain I mean like actual deep like existential pain of knowing that I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing here on this planet because I know that when I'm doing it I thrive and and everybody in the world reflects to me that thriving that things are just made easy and open yes there's struggle but the existential dread isn't there you know and a struggle is, is nothing when you're actually living in your passion. And so that spirituality for me, that healing comes from deep and a profound self-acceptance. And that when we're in the habit of not accepting ourselves, who we are, what we're supposed to be doing on this planet at this time, because I truly believe that we're all here for a reason. I was born at this time, you know, in 1988 for a reason. And that each one of us was born for a particular reason. We all came with a gift, a story, a healing, a something to share with this world. And when we're not doing it, we're actually withholding. We're withholding that from not just ourselves, but from the entire world. When we're not being who we're supposed to be. And that's what creates suffering. That's what creates disease. That's what creates disease. When we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. And so the relationship between being and doing is huge. You know, in our tradition and Islam, we say, Aqal wa tawakkal. you have to also like be thinking, you have to be doing while you're also having faith. You know, it's not just this process of like, oh, I just accept myself. So now everything should just lay out for me in the world. No, it's, it's deep self-acceptance and also like putting in the effort to show and to show yourself that you're, you believe you're here for a reason. And that's when things unfold. That's when things heal. That's when we can um, heal what hurts within us and for the whole world. I love that. And I love the concept of everybody is on this earth for some sort of purpose, because really what is culture and what is humanity, but the sum of each small contribution that we all make. I love that that's such an important piece to you. And it seems like in your journey, it's been really important to realize that finding yourself and finding your purpose is that you, you do have a contribution, you know, and this contribution has to be made. Like it's literally, yeah. No matter what anyone says about it. No matter if your parents or your friends take it seriously or not, if you're doing it, you're good, right? Yeah, I, I love that. You talk a little bit about the pain that you went through. So what are some of like the particular traumas that you're looking to heal through your work? Yeah, I mean, so many. <laughs> and I can laugh about it now because therapy and journaling and spiritual work, um, but, uh, you know, I think a lot of us walk around with 
a mother wound, a father wound, a wound of sort of just confusion and disconnection. And I think the big one is uh, the, the, the colonial wound, you know, and, and we don't even know it's there a lot of the time, especially growing up. I'll just share one little anecdote. Growing up, spending summers in Syria, I was often told like, you know, because of the French influence, you know, you want the, the little petite bouche, you, you know, like the small, delicate, feminine mouth. And I remember hearing, um, but she'll be okay because she's got the fair skin, you know, like Beba, so she'll be okay. You know, somebody will still marry this poor girl with a big mouth. <laughs> like, and that, me not understanding that and having Syrians, you know, growing up in Flint, Michigan, telling me, wow, your mouth is so ugly. It's like a monkey's mouth, you know, and, and hearing that kind of stuff and not understanding that number one, it's colonial and number two, it's white supremacist and racist that it actually stems from white supremacy and even the comparison to a monkey is totally racialized. And where do we get that? We get it from white supremacy. We get it from this structure that undergirds so much pain in the world and we're not even willing to identify it as Arabs. We're not racist, we're Arabs. There's black Arabs, you know, like we're just so, we want to be so removed from that conversation, but we're not. And once we once we recognize that colonial wound, I think everything gets a little bit easier and we can breathe a little bit easier just in identifying it and saying it exists <laughs> and not being in denial. So that hearing that growing up and not understanding it and growing up and then having to learn about colonialism. We even grew up in an era where still my parents spoke French, you know, they, they, they had to, they were forced to study French in school. So we're not that far away from this stuff. French culture is still such a big part of Syrian culture. It still permeates our, our lives in so many ways. You know, I went to Lebanon recently and in Lebanon, my husband was just like, why is nobody speaking Arabi? Everybody speaks French. And if you, if you did speak Arabi, you were low class. You weren't seen as a real somebody. You were seen as low class. You were seen as, you know, uncultured. And we, it, was hard to, it was hard to be there in some ways as somebody who has identified this deep colonial wound. Because until we can start to heal from it, until we can identify it, we can't start to heal from it. So that's, that's a big one. And I think... We have to do the work of affirming the beauty of our culture. Of We have to stop the, the plastic surgery. I, I understand if, peop, if it makes people feel good, but we also have to identify and recognize why it makes them feel good. Why they have to change their features in order to feel good about themselves. Why is that such a deep desire and drive for so many girls growing up in the Middle East? Why is everybody running to Turkey to get their nose job? Like, why is that happening? You know, and I think we, we, just, we just have to do that work of asking good questions and making sure we're doing things for good reasons rather than just so that we can be beautiful. Well, then what is beauty? Who holds the keys to beauty? Why do we identify this nose as beautiful and this one not as beautiful? Where did that come from? And how do we do the work of shifting that into a better place? You know, where what is Arab is not always what is ugly and what is barbaric and backwards. Did you ever, when you were growing up, uh, wish you were white? Oh, honey. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I never had the experience of wishing I was white. I, I, I was very lucky to be the seventh of eight kids. So I had older siblings who were constantly like ragging on white culture already. So 
I feel like I didn't have to go through that. I, th I feel like my older siblings went through that for me in yeah. some way. But I did grow up feeling jealous in some ways of uh, the simplicity of what it was to be white, to not be constantly conflicted inside of my own identity and to not understand why they could just walk around and identify uh, and them understanding themselves as the norm. I was almost like jealous of that. But um, I'm so grateful for Arabi food and culture and music and non blandness and seasoning and flavor. I don't, I don't feel any kind of jealousy anymore because I, I have come to a place where I understand what I have and, and I understand the colonial project in that they want what we have. Um, that is all that colonialism, white supremacy, racism, that's all that is. It's an intense insecurity with what you have and a desire to conquer what is out there because it's better, <laughs> you know, and to prove to yourself that if you can conquer that, then probably you are better. But, you know, when you have that deep sense of insecurity, I, I mean, I'm just grateful at this point in my life. <laughs> That's awesome. And I, I remember one of my favorite things about going to Egypt growing up, just to go back to your point, was for once you felt like you're not an identity. I totally get what you mean, where, you know, you, you go there and you feel like you're the norm for once. You're it, nobody. Yeah, exactly. It's nice to be nobody and to be invisible sometimes. I, I recently lived in Morocco and walking around Marrakesh was just so dreamy because you weren't stared at nobody followed you in the store unless they thought you were cute <laughs> you know it wasn't like people are uh, like offended by your existence or confused about hijab or are enamored by hijab it it was just you know you look like everybody you sound like everybody you blend in and that invisibility is so is such a beautiful thing i do want to talk about some of your music I listened to the songs and I read the lyrics and I love them. You wrote the song Lifted while you were experiencing postpartum depression. And you talked about you lost a piece of yourself and then you found a piece of yourself through this process. Could you comment a little bit about that? What you lost and what you found? I think anybody who's been through depression understands what it feels like to just walk through the world kind of numb and where nothing feels the way it should. It isn't some, I mean, it's hard to describe depression as just like sadness because it's not so much sadness. It's just, at least the way I experienced it was just a real lack of feeling. Nothing felt good. Nothing felt bad. It was almost like impossible to just feel anything. And I, having just become a mother for the second time, I was like, oh, this is just baby blues. It's not postpartum depression per se. But then it didn't go away. You know, the way I had experienced it the first time kind of go away. It just kind of, one day I woke up and at least the first time I became a mother, um, I woke up and one day I was just back to myself. And this wasn't happening the second time. I was just like in a fog, in a haze. And I was also finishing my graduate work my master's program. I was also working as a chaplain. I had also just released my first song. So many things were happening at once and I was feeling nothing. And I just wondered if I was ever going to come back, if I was ever going to find myself again. And I think that was the scariest question that came up during that time was, am I ever going to feel again like myself? like the vibrant woman I was before. And it wasn't until, I mean, I, I sought help. You know, I, I started going to therapy and slowly, it took about a year and some change till I started feeling like myself again. Was it the same self? No, uh, that's, that's a great question and point. I, I couldn't... Um, 
I wanted to go back to that same self. And I think one of the, the painful pieces was recognizing that I was never going to be the same again, not because the depression wasn't lifting or, uh, you know, the postpartum depression wasn't shifting and changing, but it was more that life happens and life changes you. And now I had two kids and now I had um, a baby and, uh, you know, my, my older child was getting older and what does that mean? And, you know, just sort of the acceptance of the transitions in life was a huge lesson that I had to learn. And that song, it was really interesting because it was right around the time I was feeling the worst. Like maybe I was never going to be happy again. Um, Maybe I was never going to be able to feel anything ever again. And that melody came to me. And it was this like, very strange experience of of a melody sort of coming into my heart it's it's hard to explain <laughs> it sounds demonic um <laughs> but it you know it was beautiful it felt angelic in a, in a in a certain kind of way where something came into me that in a way healed my heart and made me feel like not only was i going to be okay i was going to be better than before as long as I accepted the new that was coming and that I wasn't trying to go back to something that was in the past. You know, mm-hmm. if I was okay in the moment and just being okay in the present moment, that everything was going to be okay. And that was where that song came from. Mm-hmm. I can lift you out of your pain. And the words came. And at that same time, I was very hungry. I was living in New York, in Manhattan, and I was very hungry for community. And I feel like this is, again, so cliche, but New York is lonely, you know? There's so many people and it's such a big city, but it's also a lonely place. Everybody is super individualistic and kind of focused on their goals, their work, their family, their life. And I was also in that mentality, you know? So it wasn't like everyone was like that except me. I was in that same mentality. But when that song hit, it made me remember that community is the place that we find our greatest healing. And that together, when each one of us, again, I go back to that, that part where each one of us is doing our work, our small piece of the puzzle, the entire puzzle can be, can be beautiful and can be made. And it's not all on one of us. It's a community process of healing, of growing, of, yeah, life. Thank you for your vulnerability uh, in talking about that. You brought up the point of community, which I think it makes a great segue into, you're, you're very intersectional in your work. So like one of your song lyrics from Rock My Hijab is, make a feminist planet, woman haters get banished, covered up or not, don't take us for granted. And even in the comments right now, we have Johanna uh, commenting, I'm Latina and your music has helped me so much with viewing the world and your culture as well. So can you talk a little bit about how intersectionality has not just how you've tackled it in your work, but how it's actually helped you heal? Yeah, I mean, the concept of intersectionality, of course, is it comes from an academic place. And we can talk about the origins of that word. But... I think the the piece that is really wanting to be spoken and come through in this space is that we are complex and that the more we try to simplify our identities and the more we try to just be one thing or one identity or over-identify with one part of ourselves, that's when we suffer and we're in pain. And I I already said this today, but it feels like this is the overarching theme of of this conversation. But when we practice radical self-acceptance, that we, we can be Arab and Muslims and musicians and whatever it is, you know, straight, queer, non-binary when we when we are able to accept all of the parts of ourselves 
simultaneously, we can heal. And it's when we over identify with one part and we ignore or just leave other parts of ourselves to the side that we suffer. And so, yeah, I, I feel like my music is a reflection of that I'm striving to heal that what is it called like uh fractioning that separation seeking to seeking to heal those separations in my identity that they don't have to be separate that i can be all of that at the same time i can be muslim woman artist hijabi rapper chaplain mother wife I, you know, I can be all of those things at the same time. And I actually think that that's why my video for Wrap My Hijab was so, uh, it shifted something for people in the zeitgeist because they saw a um, muhajaba who was also on her way to being a mother, very pregnant. And it created a sort of cognitive dissonance in people's minds. How can she be doing all of those things simultaneously. And how can she be practicing that kind of radical self-acceptance by being a rapper and a muhajaba and obviously Muslim and obviously practicing and obviously rapping yeah. <laughs> at the same time? I think it kind of blew a fuse in a lot of people's minds. And that was why I got a lot of backlash. I think we suffer as a global society. I'm not even just talking about Arabs or Muslims or anybody. I think we suffer as a global society from that fragmentation, that lack of self-acceptance. And people seeing me do it, I think, made people mad. Mm. People are mad at liberation when they see it. And mm. people who were embracing of it, I, I often saw that they were the ones who were living their best lives. They were the ones living their truest, being their truest selves and embracing all of those things that may be hard to embrace. And a lot of the people who, um, me being free to be me, were often unhappy and unable for whatever reason, because maybe they were young and still living in their parents' homes and not able to be who they wanted to be. But often they had the loudest things to say about me. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for that. Falah and Azim both have similar points. And I'll read both questions. So Falah asks, do you feel that as Arabs who come to terms with our painful histories, we lose our ability to be critical of our own communities? And then Azim comments and asks, you mentioned that perceiving art and religion as mutually exclusive is colonial residue. Well, in fact, Islamic literalism and Salafism started in Arabia that was never colonized. Do you think that calling colonialism as the root of drawbacks in Arabic culture is limiting for self-critiquing ourselves? White preference, for instance, is deep-rooted in Arab culture going back to the Prophet's time. Yeah, I think those are great questions. The, the piece about literalism and Salafism and that Arabia was never colonized, well, you have to make a distinction between what is Arab and what is Arabian because there is a multiplicity of culture even within the Arabian continent. And so when you're talking about the Arabis and the Arab, it's a very different co conversation. And while they weren't colonized, I mean, this is like more of a history lesson than anything else, but while they weren't colonized, one culture certainly took supremacy or superiority over the other. And that came more in the modern era. And you can call it neo-colonial because it came in the modern era with oil money. And so it wasn't colonized so far as you didn't have uh, an invading army, but it was colonized in that you had foreign influence and foreign wealth being funneled in to support a, a government that fell into place in order to supply the world with low cost oil. So, I mean, that's just a long, long conversation. Uh, and, and calling colonialism the root of the drawbacks in Arab culture, you know, neo-colonialism is a huge conversation that we need to be talking more about. It doesn't look the same way that an invading army looked, but it feels the same way 
with, you know, the way it marginalizes certain people with certain identities. And then let's go back to Farah's question. I mean, being critical of our own communities is exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> I don't think we limit that. People, people love to hate on my song, Dog, because I'm calling out men in positions of religious, political, whatever, authority. Um, and people don't like that. People don't like for me to say anything bad or negative about Arab men because they're already, they already have it bad enough, right? A lot of these guys are always talking about how we already got it bad enough, people calling us Islamic, people calling us terrorists, you know, getting frisked, uh, stopped, frisked in New York City, you know, being stopped at every airport, getting put on no-fly lists, all of that. But sorry, if you're acting like trash, I'm going to call you trash, <laughs> you know? And the way that people treat you on the outside has nothing to do with the behavior that I'm calling out. And the reason that I even care to call out problematic misogyny and patriarchy within my own community is because of, for the sake of love, is because I love Arab men, because I love my people and I want my people to be better and to heal from the, the wounds that we collectively have because when, when we're all better, the world will be better, you know? So it's, in some ways, it's selfish for me to call out my Arab brothers. And so self-critique is important. I'm not the kind of person who's going to blame everything on the colonizer. We, we have self-enforcing problematic ideas within our own minds. And de decolonization starts in the mind and the heart. And we have to do it for ourselves. You know, I'm not, uh, blaming the colonizer doesn't make anything better. Blaming the men in power doesn't make anything better unless you're doing the work to heal those wounds. So I, I, I think we should never stop critiquing our own communities. In fact, that's a part of the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. That's a part of the Islamic tradition is to say burying your infant daughters is backwards and and horrible and you have to stop doing that he came to be critical of his own community that is why he was sent to such a he was sent from such a problematic community to a, such a problematic community because we all have our work to do Thank you for that answer. And I do want to comment a little bit about what you said on colonialism. I think a lot of the times when we talk about decolonizing our colonial wounds, we think that we're just blaming our problems on somebody else. But I think it's really important for your own self-reflection to understand how you view yourself. Because if you're not viewing yourself accurately, you can't move forward. And I think that that's sort of the core of the colonial. Uh, so Alia asks, was there a reason you chose rapping as a form of expression? Yeah, I mean, I didn't exactly choose it. It was, it just, yeah, it was just kind of the culture I grew up in, um, being from Flint. Poetry was sort of organic for me. And then moving from poetry into rap, into hip hop, was a really organic transition. And I think growing up in Flint, learning learning poetry from the Black community, from Black mentors, specifically Black women. The language of hip hop was just the way I was taught to express my particular voice. And it was that culture, uh, you know, the, 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 the slam culture, hip hop culture that affirmed my voice and taught me that my voice was even important in the slew and the, the, the very huge audience of all voices. And I didn't, I didn't necessarily know that before I was told that, that my story, my words, my poetry, my music could be important. I was just a little kid from Flint, you know, a um, little Arab kid from Flint who didn't know that. And uh, yeah, it, it, I feel grateful to be a part of hip hop culture. In a lot of ways, hip hop saved me. And again, I go back to a cliche, but it's true. You know, I don't know what I would be doing or who I would be without 
being taught this great tool for liberation, you know? I love that. And it's also, it's very interesting because as an Arab, it sort of speaks to the oral tradition that is so strong in our culture. And that's what Laura has done such a good job with Najlis of reviving the oral tradition. You're doing such a good job through your slam poetry. So it's, it's, it's nice to see people sort of re-embracing that. It's is- never ending. The yeah. connections are never ending between indigenous culture and jazz and blues and hip hop culture. It's, it's all connected. It's all connected. You mentioned early on that when you first started doing slam poetry, you, you thought it was I. And I, for non-Arabic speakers on the call, means shameful. And it's often this word that's used specifically to control the actions of women, really the root of it. So how did you move past that? And do you feel like fear of what society will think still holds you back today? I mean, is that something we ever get over? <laughs> I just want to know. Somebody tell me. <laughs> of course. Uh, I feel like we're, we're just raised in such a culture of filial piety and the deference and respect towards elders, which I hold in high regard. I never want to do or say anything that makes my mother look at me and say, oh, God, <laughs> that's my daughter. And so, of course, that's always on my mind and heart. And I actually see it as a beneficial thing at this point in my life. The the Ayyub conversation has moved from something to do with who I am as a girl, as a woman, because like girls were just like Ayyub, your body is Ayyub, everything about you is Ayyub, your voice is Haram, everything, right? And I've moved to a place of Ayyub being put in its rightful place where I then becomes a lack of showing love, where love is due, respect where respect is due. Shame is a beautiful thing when in its proper place. When shame is used as a weapon against children, against women, then it becomes problematic. But when shame is used as a means for, like, war is shameful. (laughs) <laughs> war is aib harming children is aib you should feel ashamed if you've ever laid a hand on a child or a woman that is aib that is wrong so when aib is put in its proper place it's liberation it's love so i think putting those things in their rightful place especially as an adult who now has her own children i'm coming to understand that aib is is very beneficial for us as as a species but then forces and powers that be use it as a weapon. They weaponize Ayyub against us, specifically women and children. <laughs> so that's when it's wrong and bad. And how did I learn that? I mean, a lot of journaling and trial and error <laughs> and realize and study, honestly, studying the fact that my body existing is not a shameful thing. A woman having a period is not aib. A woman's menstrual cycle is not aib. Um, Those things were taught to us as aib, as things we were never supposed to speak about or mention. And the fact that that was taught to us, that was (laughs) aib. I love that. I love that. So Sophia asks, you say that accepting all of our identities will help one along their healing. What really helped with this radical self-acceptance? I'm a queer Arab Latina, and it feels like all three of those identities can't even exist in a space made for them. First of all, if this is the right Sophia, shout out to Sophia because she just wrote a paper about me. Is this the same Sophia? Hey, what's up? (laughs) Okay, it is the right Sophia. Hey, girl. But yes, I, this is going to be a sucky answer. It takes time and effort. And the teenage years and 20s, honestly, they suck. Because your hypothalamus hasn't even finished developing yet. It is not what it is supposed to be when you reach adulthood. That's why in Islamic theology or tradition, 
you don't actually reach adulthood until your 40s. <laughs> you know, real adulthood is 40. That's because all of your identities have settled and that you have arrived at a place of a little bit more so solidness. And I can tell you as somebody in her 30s who now has children, I see myself moving towards that and away from the questioning and the confusion around identity. And because I, I in a lot of ways, no longer hold myself to fixed identity around anything, okay, around anything, fixed identity. I just, I, I, I've been talking about this a lot lately with friends especially, but I've just developed this philosophy of non-arrival, okay? I just, I just, I'm, I'm totally uh, happy to admit that I don't know anything, including about myself. <laughs> and that philosophy of non-arrival is something that I wish somebody had told me growing up that you never arrive at yourself growing up, right? Like you're not going to wake up one day at 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, knowing who you are because it's a constant journey of, of witnessing your own self, a constant journey of allowing yourself to just be who you are in the moment. And that acceptance of non-arrival came about because I was sick and tired of waiting for myself to be the, the, the rapper or the poet or the artist or creative or the chaplain or the student that I, I was supposed to be in my mind or the person who dressed or who was cool or who looked a certain kind of way. And I was sick and tired of shopping for that person that never arrived. I'd put on the new outfit and I would still feel like the day, the Mona that was wearing the pajamas just five seconds ago. The new outfit didn't make me feel like the better me, the new me that I was supposed to be in the outfit, right? And as soon as I let go of having to be something in the future, a lot of that disappears when you are just okay with where you are. But that's like so anti-capitalist. <laughs> it's so anti-capitalist to be okay with where you are and how much money you're making in this moment or not making in this moment, what your job is in this moment or your job is not in this moment. It's so anti-capitalist, anti-Protestant to simply be chill with who you are now because you, it's, it's all about the hustle culture. It's all about the hustle mentality where you got to go, you got to work hard, you got to hustle, you got to get yours. No, I'm straight. I love that. I love that. The idea of se radical self-acceptance is uh, something that everybody needs to do, you know, with, with the, all of its iterations and evolutions. Mona, thank you so much for coming onto this call. Thank you, Ahmed, Farah, Lara. Thank you. thank you so much. It was a lot of fun and I pray for great success for you guys in all of your projects. And, and I love, love, love your sincerity, you guys, really.